that's okay with you guys. Um, what I, I wanted to do, there's a couple of things. One is, um, people are still sending me ideas uh, for their projects. For uh, this, for the final capstone project, there are two parts. The first part is to uh, talk to me about your idea and make sure that I say, yes, that sounds good, go ahead. And then the second part is the actual project. The reason why I do it that way is, <clears throat> uh, Ryan was in the other class, at another class that I mentioned this. Uh, several years ago, I was in a philosophy class and I made something, I, I did this, you know, a Socratic dialogue that I thought was amazing. And I, for my final project for the class, I turned it in like three hours before the deadline. And the teacher told me that it didn't have anything to do with the assignment, didn't fit with the class. And he should have failed me, but he felt sorry for me. He knew I put a work in it, so I got a C. And if you guys are going to be putting 10 hours into a project, we need to make sure that it fits within the parameters of this class, which is Renaissance Forward. So basically any world art that was done 1350 or later, or more recently, I guess. And we, um, we need to just validate that your idea is going to be uh, a good idea for 10 hours of, of uh, workload, because that's how much time you have to put into this project. I have responded to everything that I've seen and most are are pretty solid there's uh every once in a while somebody will say hey i want to i want to do this and there's absolutely there's either very little or no description about what they're going to actually do they just give me a topic and sometimes people will say I'd, I'd like to do this and what they tell me is only going to be like three hours of work at the most and so i'll write back and say that sounds like a great idea to start why don't you add these other things to it and it, uh, rarely there'll be somebody who says, oh, I want to do all this. And I say, you, well, this project is only worth 10 hours of your time. You've got to tone it way down. But that whole exchange is what you need to turn in and um, have approved before you, you should go on and actually start on that final project. And so, um, and the other big reason I, I do this is to make sure that you focus your project again on the parameters of this class, which is world art and architecture from 1350 forward. I, I mentioned it um, in the previous class that I have had people present projects that I simply could not give them credit for because they had nothing to do with the time frame that we're dealing with. And so it's really important to make sure that you demonstrate that we had that conversation. And the way to demonstrate that this assignment is you submit like a screenshot of our emails back and forth. You submit a document that has those <clears throat> emails in it with uh, you know, your initial proposal, my uh, ask for edits, a, your secondary proposal, and then my, yeah, that sounds great, go ahead. I have had people tell me to uh, that they sent me a link to Google Docs and I could edit it for them. I'm not going to edit anybody's stuff. Um, I will tell you what needs to be changed and you need to edit it. And I do not like going to Google Docs because the antivirus program that I have and my VPN on my computer uh, doesn't allow me to. You know, in, unless it's somebody that is already established. Uh, a significant email chain with me, um, my computer does not allow me to access Google Docs like that, which can be really frustrating. So if the only way that you are used to form it, um, sending in assignments is with Google Docs, I would heartily recommend that you take a screenshot or move that into, edit it into um, a Word doc and then submit that uh, for the points. All right, is, is, that, is that clear for everybody? All right, excellent. All right, the subject of today is we're just gonna, we were gonna just do the next module, which talks about feminist art. 
But we ended, last week we ended kind of abruptly before uh, we finished the, the abstract stuff. And it was mostly because I just kept rambling. So what I wanted to do is go back and revisit the end of last week's module, because I think the, the things that we missed will, will help dealing with uh, this week's module, for sure. And I'm just fiddling with something right now. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, excellent, it works. All right. Now we were talking about abstraction and abstract expressionism. These are important enough that I think it's worth looking at them a little bit more. And uh, what I thought would be really good, we did look at that one uh, video with uh, two art professional um, art historians on how to look at art. And I thought this was an excellent video as well. This is uh, with Steve Martin, and uh, he has done an awful lot in many museums around the country to help them with their collections, to help them make connections with uh, people that have the chutzpah to donate, as well as uh, sometimes uh, people that own expensive art, works of art will allow museums to show them on their behalf, and uh, he's done a lot of that. But in this particular video, he's working with a couple art historians to talk about how he, as a non-art historian, looks at abstract art. And I want you, but as we watch this, I want you to think in your mind, the, remember the four tools of um, artistic critique. Do either of you remember what the first tool is? And it starts with a D. Evaluate. That's the last one. Uh, the first one starts with a D. It's describe. I thought you said E. My bad. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was like, hmm, maybe I'm the wrong one. <laughs> no, you're not. Uh, the problem is I am handing out Halloween candy, which means that some of it accidentally falls into my mouth. And so um, if, I, if you heard that, you probably heard that because I didn't say it right because there's candy in my mouth. But yeah, the first one starts with D, it's described. The second one starts with A. Analyze. Analyze, excellent. The third one uh, starts with I. Interpret. Interpret. And then the fourth one is, as uh, Ryan said, evaluate. Describe. And, I, <laughs> and as you listen to uh, these guys talk about this art, uh, think about those things. And see if you can hear that process this, um, that uh, Steve Martin use, uses. See if you can hear those elements, those tools echoed in the process he describes. Low on the right. Exactly the same as it was. <laughs> <laughs> To start, could you introduce yourselves to ah, a British audience? Okay. Uh, I think it would be a way to introduce myself to it. Hi, it's Steve Martin. <laughs> All the guests were asked to choose one work of art <laughs> from the collection. You've chosen two. Uh, yes. One painting is by Stanton MacDonald Wright. They're both American paintings. And this was done in 1917, and the one on the, over here is done by Morgan Russell, done in 1922. The essentially minor things compared to everything else that hangs at MoMA. I thought, gee, those are, those are so, they're like lonely. <laughs> and uh, so I picked them. And uh, these two artists, I believe, were both in Paris at the time, and they started working on this uh, completely abstract system of painting. They called it synchromism. Yes which is with color, it means. Yeah. And they had came up with a fancy name for it. Right. As we all should. I don't 
generally care about theories that kind of get in the way of looking at the picture. But I think the result of working from a theory can be fantastic, but it also could be done maybe without the theory, but you don't need to know the theory in order to appreciate the pain. I really like to look at it and I can look at it a long time because there's a lot of different parts that succeed as a whole. I think of this as an intellectual painting, like a, like a leger. It's the construction of the picture mm -hmm. that he's mm -hmm. interested in mm -hmm. and that you're interested in, right? I don't know, but I think so. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. When I look at this picture, there's you a real sing? sense of, you want to sing? luckily not, <laughs> but lots of motion, lots of um, rhythm. And there's a lot of depth. I mean, I just, the, the image goes way deep. It's almost like uh, in the top there, it feels a little bit like sky. I don't think he intended that. I hate to say this, but now I'm starting to see a landscape with mountains, sky, and water. I believe pictures reveal themselves through t over time. You can't really get it in one or one lengthy look. You know, it's great to be able to live with a painting or visit a painting in a museum and go back and back and back. And the good ones really do keep on giving. It's, it's, it's amazing. A picture is stationary, it's immobile, and yet it changes for you. But I'm just, just going to step back on this because my foot's asleep. I just am now convinced this is this is a landscape painting. This is a little, this is a, yeah. a stream. These are jutting rock. This is a mountaintop. That's the sky. That's sort of cloudy. Has it improved? Absolutely for me. But now I see almost like a narrative story. I mean, even the Morgan Russell is it's very, it's very voluminous. It's a floating yeah. object in a way. But I think if you came back on another day, you'd see something different too. Yeah, maybe. Right? That's. No, I'm convinced. This is a landscape, <laughs> and nothing will ever change my mind. I'd always assumed this picture was one thing, and then sat here for an hour and looked at it, yeah. and it changed. I like that short video for a, a couple reasons, and one of them is he's applying in a non-academic way. He's still a, applying that process. You know, he's describing the different colors that he saw in the painting. He's describing the depth that he feels. He talked a little bit about the worldview of the the person when he we uh, of the painters when he talked about synchronism and that they were within that abstraction movement. Uh, it was, that was an outgrowth of the birth of, of cubism in, in part. And he, he talks about how the artist might have done it. You know, how's he laying color down and different things like that. And at the very end, he's evaluating it and then it changes for him. And I, and I love that because this is something that abstract art begins to do, which is uh the 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 doors for this process are less open for previous uh styles of art that were more interested in creating a, a shared space for potential viewers you know a shared symbology or language for potential viewers and i i really love that about um abstraction because uh, and and one thing that we're consistently hearing is you sit with it for an hour, then you have to come back and enjoy it again. You have to look at it again. And every time you come back to it, it becomes something new. And uh, I mentioned last week, there's a, an art historian in the 50s that was very influential, uh, who said, if you don't get it immediately, it's not worth getting. And I, it that really bothers me. Because I think if it's worth doing, it should be worth spending time with uh, for, for most things. And uh, Abstraction is something that allows us to have a more effective and immediate result with that imaginary conversation we have with um, uh, the the artist the, whose work we encounter. And I should mention this is my Halloween costume. I'm Guy Fieri, and this is my Guy Fieri hat. So just in case you know you guys were wondering, um, last Halloween my kids took us to 
the ski lift at Park City during their Halloween uh, festival. We and the we all had to dress as different versions of Guy Fieri. So one person in the, the family was a, a, a zombie version of Guy Fieri. And uh, I mentioned to Ryan that one of them was a, a stripper version. And that version kind of made me um, uncomfortable. But uh, most of it was, was a lot of fun. Let's see. And I, I wanted to uh, share just a couple other things. I, I think there is a really worthwhile uh, video, another worthwhile video to watch. And I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry, it is, it is playing on a video and I'm trying to get off. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to watch this video as well. And then we're going to talk about it. Developed in the 1940s, though we can find a few examples that pre-act expressionism was a style of art that developed in the 1940s, though we can find a few examples that predate that time period. This painting is called Composition Number no. 8 by Kandinsky, and it's wonderful and delightful. We can see geometry in there, we can see organic shapes, all sorts of things, but what we don't see is a subject, and that was really important. There are no cats, dogs, people, landscapes. The artists of this time were really just looking to express their emotions through color and shape or to record their body movements. If you find a subject in the painting or if one is alluded to, it cannot be this style of art. Abstract expressionists were really interested in painting in the purest way possible. So here we see an example by Jackson Pollock, and it's a splash painting or a drip painting. He would literally just fly the paint right onto his canvas or drip it onto the floor. He wasn't interested in trying to depict something because everybody else was doing that. He wanted to just enjoy the joy of painting. And that would be through grabbing a stick, putting it in a can of paint and just dripping it over the canvas. Sometimes his canvases were so large, he would build a bridge over top of it and cast his paint from the bridge. Here we can see him working on his painting. You can see him there bent over, splashing paint onto the canvas, recording his body movements. Again, there's no subject. And he's trying to express what he feels through his use of color and paint and lines. This painting by Mark Rothko is called White, Red on Yellow, number 13. We don't see a subject. You might think perhaps that's a window, but it's not. He's just putting colors together and he feels that one color next to another will exude some kind of emotional value. He did many kinds of different paintings like this, but they were all very simple. One shape, one color next to another. Very little blending is going on here, but he was interested in expressing an emotion. Mr. Motherwell is another painter of this style, and he did this painting called Elegy to the Spanish Republic. He actually did over 200 paintings on this, and they're all very similar. We have this use of black throughout the painting. And for him, black represented death. White kind of represented space and the space between death. So it's life and death. And he witnessed this through the Spanish Civil War uh, in his country. So I think that, that's a really good one. And it, as you, it would be good to go back and look at some of these and see a little bit about these artists, like particularly uh, these links that I have here after each of the artists show uh, a collection of their work in something of a gallery type setting. And you can see some of the stuff that they do. Now this, from what we just learned, this very much then becomes, we understand this to be abstract because there is a recognizable subject there. So it is with this, you can see a sun there. And then if we go back and look at some, and so this is going to be abstract as well because it's based on something that we can see. But if we look at Wassily Kandinsky, then he's painting sounds and how he, he feels regarding the sounds. So it becomes very difficult to find any sort of a subject in it.
and it then it becomes recognizable as abstract expressionism. So that's the biggest difference between uh, those. I want to share just some of, of the paintings that, that he did right here. Uh, Wassily Kandinsky was somebody who suffered from synesthesia, which means that your senses get conflated so you can feel sometimes the color yellow and you can smell sounds. Very, very interesting. And Lee Krasner was the wife of Jackson Pollock and both of them were absolutely astounding painters. Um, Jackson Pollock was quite a bit more flamboyant. And so uh, the cult of personality, a cult of personality developed around him quite quickly. Lee, Kla Lee Krasner was uh, put a lot of herself into her paintings and wanted the paintings to speak for themselves. So she wasn't as big of a celebrity and really she really supported Jackson Pollock and a lot of his stuff which I, I, I think is interesting. And then we have Barnett Newman, which I, I think is just absolutely astounding. He does these paintings that are, well, I'll show you an image. They are very, very apparently simple paintings where like this one will have just a, a white field with a vertical blue stripe with black on the edges. And that's it. And what he is doing is trying to express the emotion he feels in a particular moment. And uh, instead of an actual uh, object that it's based on. Now the, the doorbell just knocked. I'm, I'm gonna take off. I'm gonna go to that. I'll be right back. I love this. <laughs> I'm so glad he's still doing trick or treating. Okay, I'm back. So, I, and I, I really love uh, Barnett Newman because of this kind of stuff that he did. And then you look, we look at Morris Lewis. I think he's a really good counterpoint to Barnett Newman. And in this case, all he's doing is taking cans of thinned paint and sometimes stain and pouring them so that he's letting gravity do the work. So this painting is displayed with this at the top, but he actually made it with these at the top. And after he poured it, then he turned it upside down. And that's why these dark spots are where the paint settled, but you can see where he started it and the paint flows out and opens it up as it goes downhill, which is this area. And this is where it started. And th these were all called veils. Now, what is fascinating about these, these paints, uh, these paintings is we look at abstraction and it has a lot of those triangles that we saw and, and different things like that. Uh, and uh, Steve Martin saw a landscape in it. You know, they start with uh, physical objects and they change them into areas with, with triangles and, and different forms and shapes and just abstract it into simple, relatively simple elements. During that time, this is, uh, it got started right before World War I and was really strong all the way up to um, the, the mid thirties. And, uh, and it still carried on quite a bit. What's going on in the world at the time? We have World War I, which is the first time so many countries around the world were um, involved in a, in a single conflict, uh, you know, as long as people knew. And, and we have, uh, the, the post-World War I rebuilding and then the subsequent depression from the boom and then the bust and uh, where people are just really having to evaluate their role with the universe because they've lost everything. So there's a lot of stress going on and we see people using abstraction to kind of simplify the things that they see around them. And then in, we saw with uh, Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, 
um, Morris Lewis, um, Barnett Newman, and Mark Rothko, they're in a world of World War II where what was the big military advance, well, the military development that happened in World War II that really shook the foundations of the world, literally. The atomic bomb? Yeah. These guys are living with, um, you know, little kids in school would be watching uh, short movies uh, several times a week that would talk about what do you do if you see a, a bomb blast? You know, if you're close enough to an atomic bomb going off, there's not a whole lot you can do. But uh, they would still tell the kids, um, duck and cover, you know, drop and cover. And uh, there, you know, this constant undercurrent of uh, fear and stress and anxiety. And you, then we look at those paintings again, this abstract expressionism, and we realize that they are trying to communicate something that doesn't have words for it. It doesn't have a foothold in the physical world. And a large part of those paintings make sense if we look at them as meditations on the part of the artist trying to walk through their own feelings, their own feelings of anxiety um, and feelings of misunderstanding about the, the changing world. This is also the time that leads right up to the birth of the FBI's, um, uh, the department that became the profiling department later on, because this is when uh, you start getting um, uh, strong serial crimes as well. And uh, it's interesting to me in, in a pretty sad way that in a happy way that a lot of people were turning to art to deal with this insecurities about the world. And then in a really horrible way, some people were turning to uh, different kinds of crime uh, that, th that nobody had ever seen before on that kind of scale. I, ju I just think that that's, that's really sad. I, my vote is to support the artists um, in that kind of a situation. But I, I wanted to touch on that just kind of briefly before we go into the next thing, because um, I wanted to really underscore what abstraction was, what uh, abstract and what abstract expressionism is. So uh, one of the big differences, um, they, those two different things next to each other are really good because they also kind of open a door to our understanding of what is the difference between modernism and postmodernism. Do you guys remember the rough dates for the period known as modernism? It's basically mid 19th century to mid 20th century. So about 1850 to 1950, about. Then postmodernism is about 1950 forward and contemporary art is particularly 1980 until now, about roughly. The difference with um, modernism, that's when people are starting to explore ideas of abstraction, where they're finding different ways to communicate uh, content outside of uh, shared symbols, you know, because most of the art that we're really comfortable with, that we're familiar with, is based on shared symbols. Like if we see a horse or we see a bridge, we can recognize the horse or the bridge. But in the period of, of uh, modernism, people were trying to, were experimenting with pulling away from that shared uh, symbolism. So you get uh, experiments with brush strokes, you get experiments with color use, you get experiments with shape. Uh, and experiments with what aspect of an image or an event do you choose to paint? And postmodernism, a big thing that separates that out is that artists are no longer concerned with expressing a subject matter that anybody can relate to. The content is not as important as the process itself. So we, we look at uh, cubism. You know, and most Cubist paintings are going to be where the artist is exploring a landscape, exploring a, a still life, exploring a portrait of somebody or people. But then we go to somebody like uh, Morris Lewis and all he's doing is just creating beautiful things by pouring, pouring paint on a canvas. He is more interested with the process of what's going on with the paint. And then he uses that as an allegory to express or meditate. And uh, then, um, then with the Cubists who were using abstraction 
to explore new ways of expressing something specific. So do you understand the difference? Modernism deals with content and new ways of sharing content. Postmodernism deals with creating art that doesn't have to have content, you know, where you're exploring the actual uh, functionality of the materials and processes. And th that's, that's one of the big differences. But the thing that is really frustrating for people like you, uh, which is students and people who like to think, it's that doesn't quite cover it. That, that's not exactly it. And then one, uh, one artist that I keep talking about is Marcel Duchamp. He's the one who did Nude Descending a Staircase. He's also the one that took that fountain out of a demolished bathroom and put it on a stand in a museum and called it, uh, it he had liberated a urinal and called it titled it The Fountain. Um, one of the things that Marcel Duchamp publicly stated, and then later uh, friends of his in the Dada uh, art movement talked about quite thoroughly, was we, where we've been exploring content and how to express content, but we really also need to really examine what makes art art. What is it about the art that allows us to value it as art or allows us to devalue it as being not art? And so people start also exploring ideas about our relationship to content. Can you see how this is going from uh, Enlightenment era work where people are focusing on sharing the triumph of reason to now it, how, what artists are thinking about what they're doing, it feels very meta. You know, this, this almost seems like something that you hear in a Deadpool movie where he's aware that everybody else is looking at him as a comic book character. And he's talking about, he explores the whole process of relating to fictional characters and makes jokes about all the other pop culture icons that are not supposed to be referenced in comic book type movies. You know, it, that's, that's what meta means where you start thinking about the thing, the, the processes of thinking regarding the, the subject that you're addressing. And that, that can very quickly go into a very ultra confusing conversation. So now we're, we're gonna be talking about, this comes after abstract expressionism. Now, a lot of these arts, uh, movements are overlapping each other quite a bit. And when I say before and after, I'm talking about generally the birth of something. Because when somebody has an idea, a lot of the times they'll keep working on the, the idea, going back to it. If it's something that they enjoy and resonate with, they will keep going back to it their entire life. And um, as artists are looking at that, the learning from it, then they find new ways to learn and express what they learn about their environment. Now, in 1963, we are talking about uh, the birth of superhero comics as we know it really began in the late 1930s, uh, about 1938. And so we're talking about the first full generation after the birth of American superhero comics. And now comics are uh, ubiquitous, pretty much. They're, they're everywhere. They're, they're used, uh, elements of comics are used in advertising. You know, it used to be the throwaway art to entertain children and uh, people that were viewed as less intelligent, believe it or not. And by this time, a full generation later, people just accept it. You know, they, they aren't having issues with it. So we get uh, Roy Lichtenstein, who what he does is he's addressing that question that Marcel Duchamp brought up. What is art really? And so he starts creating these uh, canvases, these paintings. And I don't know if we can, if I can blow it up enough. I don't know if this is good enough resolution. You probably can't see it. But what he starts doing is he's creating paintings with print techniques that actually have, uh, you know, these, these are, are not tiny things. But in them, the texture is not paintbrush technique. They're points exactly like what you would see in a newspaper or a, a comic book page. So he is essentially taking out of context what appear to be comic book panels and blowing them up and presenting them in a setting 
where you're forced to confront them as if it were a, a, a painting. And I, I, I just think that that's absolutely fascinating. You know, people are exploring these ideas of what validates art. Now, I, I did want to share this with you. This comes from the same time period. And I think that this is a really good example of what art in other realms was doing in response to the same questions about re-examining personal relationships with worldviews. Uh, this is called the theremin. Have, have either of you heard of the theremin before? Have either of you watched Doctor Who? I, okay. I, Just the Van Gogh clip. Okay. Um, it, the Doctor Who theme song was originally designed to be played on theremin. And a theremin is a musical instrument that was specifically designed for the postmodern age. And we're going to get past this, this irritating ad. Okay. I can't hear it. You guys can't hear it at all? Could you hear the music at all, Ryan? I heard just a brief moment of it in the beginning, but not anything since. Okay, let's see. Can you hear the voiceover? No. Okay, how about you, America? Can you hear it? No, I can't hear it. Okay, um, let me let me try this and see if that will. Can you guys hear that? No. No. That is really weird. I wonder why it's not. It's not playing. Because I hear it just fine. I'm doing everything. So let me try this. Okay. Let, let, tell me if you guys can hear this then. Can you guys hear that? No. No. Okay. Uh, for whatever reason, then, my computer is not recognizing the, the sound links to these videos. Uh, but the theremin is a really interesting looking instrument that was designed uh, specifically to be an instrument for the modern age. And it's designed to be played without touching. It has two antennas. One hand is near one and it changes the tone. Uh, and then the other one changes the intensity of the tone. And uh, so the person who's playing the instrument will move their hands, and it's just it's just really weird to watch them play it, but their hands affect the electrical fields. And this, this is important because this represents a very challenging change in how people interact with uh, art, the world around them, with music, and these kinds of things. And it's, uh, let's see. Um, and, I, and I think that the art from this period that we're talking about, you know, people are going through an awful lot of transition with how much the world is changing and it is impacting most everything. And I, and I think it's, it's really good to see the art in that kind of a context, to understand or begin to appreciate how some of these movements relate to each other. Uh, because the movements are developed out of the way that the world is that these people lived in. So definitely 
go back and watch this video. I'm sorry I couldn't share it with you, and I don't know why it won't allow me to. So we have uh, four different kinds of art to talk about, op art, pop art, arte povera, and minimalism. Each of these have a little bit of a different take on art. Can you guys see the, the these videos? Yes. Okay. Um, the names are a really big clue as to what they are doing. And during this period, people are not just examining uh, process and art making they are also playing with ideas of what can validate or what can be validated as art so op art is short short for optical and you see art like this that uh, they create a lot of optical illusions or they deal with uh, things that where your eye expects something and it, it encounters something else or it gives form not because they're trying to shade an object but because the artist is depending on your brain interpreting what your eyes sees a certain way. So like this object right here, it looks to me like a piece of candy. It almost looks like this area right here on the right is coming towards me. And it looks like this area on the lower left is underneath. And this, this thing is shaped almost like an arch uh, or, or a, a bean in the shape of a C where it's resting on its two tips. I, can you guys see what I'm seeing in this? Where it's it's a it's a very simple shape, but the form is not developed by shading. It's developed by the artist, depending on what our eyes naturally do when we see black and white shapes that our our brain interprets as being the same thickness all the way through. And then the artist manipulates the shape. So we, we start feeling um, form and uh, volume. Uh, and it's all an optical illusion. Are either of you guys old enough to uh, have seen the Tron movie that Disney put out way back in the 80s? Have you ever seen it? I would recommend seeing that. It's the birth of uh, 3D digital animation. And uh, what they were doing was experimenting with creating a flat form that our eyes can assume are, is uh, that our eyes will make our brain assume is round. And that is based on what a lot of these op art artists did. And I, I include a, a few artists to, for you to look at. Uh, Bridget Riley, I really like her stuff. And uh, Victor uh, Vissarly, you can see He's using shapes that we assume our, um, our brain will see that shape and see shapes next to it. And our brain starts playing this game where it interprets this shape as a cube. And the artist knows that. And so, so they're playing with our, our brain's perceptions that this is a cube. Can you see that going on? Where this person is just using a handful of colors. And the only reason that this painting has depth is because they're, they're playing around with our brain's assumption of uh, form and that's essentially what um, op art is because again the op and op art stands for optical now pop art what does the pop stand for in pop art popular yeah exactly and uh what is fascinating to me is that the these pop artists all the pop artists, like Roy Lichtenstein, who did the Wham, the, the one we looked at in the previous page, all pop artists are working with ideas of traditional ways of setting up the important shapes in a painting and uh, creating an environment using uh, popular culture references. Um, somebody else is knocking on the door. I'll be right back. Yeah. I like candy. Are you there? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm going to go. I have to use my massage. Let her know Alyssa said hi. Okay, Carter. All right. Oh, would you like to take her to it? Um, yeah. Which one can you use? 
That was interesting. That's the first time I've had people over 20 uh, do trick or treating. But uh, you know, look at look at the pop art. And when Andy Warhol was asked why he did soup cans and why he used stuff that was already uh, in existence, he said it was because it was easier in his interview. But I, I interviewed um, a woman named Ultraviolet that was one of Andy Warhol's protégés. She studied un under him. And it was fascinating to me, what he was doing was very different he, than what he said to interviewers. What he was actually doing is trying to provide a context for people to explore those ideas that the objects that we use every day that we depend on have perhaps grown to be much more important than they should be. And what, what's fascinating about that is if we go back and look at, let's see, I'm gonna go back to this page again. If we look at the Campbell soup can right here, what's fascinating to me is that this is set up in a very similar way that uh, grand portraits were done of important people during the Renaissance and the Baroque. You know, and he, uh, Andy Warhol, instead of painting and, and really using delicate brushstrokes, he would use uh, mass media uh, products and tools like a uh, silk screen. And so when he did the Marilyn Monroe, he would do, he did that from an, uh, just an insanely popular movie that she did and created that portrait straight out of the imagery for the movie posters and uh, used mass media materials to do that, which were uh, silk screens. I, I just think it's absolutely fascinating. And a big part of that is he he want he wanted people to kind of examine the ridiculousness of popular culture. Merit Oppenheim is one that does that. And she does it a little bit differently. She played with uh, the interface of expected textures and uses for objects. So the fur teacup is a tea set. You, we have a spoon, we have a, a teacup, and we have a, tea, a platter or a plate that are lined, that are covered with real fur. And she did a lot of these kinds of things where you expect the texture to be a certain thing, but she plays with a very different texture. And one of the reasons why she's classified as an op artist or a pop artist for a lot of the stuff that she does is she uses forms and materials that are very popular and are used widely by most everybody. So these, this is not a sculpture of a cup or a sculpture of a plate or a sculpture of a spoon. They are actually uh, plate, spoon and cup that are covered by fur, which I, th I think is just amazing. Then we have uh, Peter Max, another version of this. He was uh, and still does very psychedelic type stuff where he takes very simplified imagery that you might see in a colorful magazine and puts it together in a very simplified visual language that is reminiscent of a children's book. And then he just blows the snot out of it with wild popular colors that are designed by the advertising industries to attract attention. So he, again, he's using different elements of what makes up uh, popular culture. And then who of you know who Keith Haring is? Do we, either of you know who he is? He's a young artist in the 80s who, uh, America, do you know who he is? The name sounds familiar to me. Well, um, it, it's something that once you see his art, you it's difficult to forget. But he did, he worked in New York almost exclusively and did these kinds of stick figure characters, usually using either white and black or uh, primary and secondary colors but very simple forms. And he, he wasn't an expert anatomist. You know, he wasn't another Rembrandt. All he was doing is trying to create things to engage people and engage people 
sometimes in a lighthearted way, sometimes in a very serious way. But he began by creating little vignette stories in uh, the subway systems in New York, where as you go through a station, you'd stand at the window and you'd almost see an animation because he understood how fast the trains are moving and what you would see through the windows as you went through the station. And they would be, and he would do little animations of these figures interacting with each other. And what was, what's interesting about Keith Haring is he created stuff that responded to his experience with popular culture. And then very quickly, what he created became itself and a uh, part of popular culture and influenced it. Now, Art Povera, uh, Pavra is interesting to me because this is a movement that deals with those questions of what makes art art as well as popular culture. And it's, it's called Arta Pavera, which means uh, poor art or cheap art, because it is usually made with other people's garbage. Now, this happened in Italy at the same time that um, Merit Oppenheim, Andy Warhol, and Roy Lichtenstein were working in, uh, over in uh, Italy. The artists there were kind of dealing with the same kinds of issues. In the 60s, this is where we start. Uh, there's the Korean War, and then after the Korean War, there's the Vietnam War. There's this uh, growth of the Cold War. So people are reacting to all this, kind of holding on to things that are familiar to them, desperately holding on to things that are familiar to them, and also asking questions like, what validates art? And so with Ar Arta Povera, what the artists are doing was creating environments using easily recognizable objects that other people would classify as garbage. So they weren't even necessarily manipulating the stuff. Like this is from one uh, exhibit where the, the artist just collected all these used clothes, clothing items and then built mounds and mazes and kind of hedgerows throughout an existing museum. So you would have to walk around the, the cloth to see the sculptures and the paintings. And sometimes like in this instance, the pile of clothing was as high as the Greek sculpture you probably went there to see, but it blocked your access from the front. You could only see it from the sides and the back. And very quickly, Arta Pavera became um, kind of a conversation between uh, with the artists and the viewers, asking people to engage on their uh, about their relationship with government and what's going on in the world. And they, they, were, they used a lot of really interesting metaphors that they didn't outright say. But if you look at an Arta Pavera um, uh, exhibit and get a chance to really look at it about the third or fourth time you come back to it, then you start realizing maybe this is what the person was, is talking about. And I think that that's absolutely fascinating. Now, remember we talked about modernism being the engagement of content, trying to develop either new symbologies or uh, staying away from previously used symbologies. That's what modernism is about from 1850 to 1950. What was postmodernism? Do you guys remember what I, what I said that, that one of the um, overarching concepts of postmodernism was? If modernism is about exploring con um, content in new ways, what was postmodernism about? It steered away from recognizable concepts. Yeah, trying trying to avoid the content. Very good. Now, with with minimalism, this is really fascinating to me because again, this is at a period of time that was very stressful to live in. You know, you you have the Cold War going on. Anybody could be a spy. This is when um, this is the aftermath of the McCarthy trials, all that kind of stuff. And so people are exploring new ways of creating while avoiding content. And minimalism is seems to fit in that uh, frame of mind pretty well, where you're creating something where the only reason to enjoy it is because, for example, in this case, it's the color blue. Or maybe it's a piece of wood. Or maybe it's a shape. And 
it's validation for existence is to invite you just to explore what that shape is or what that color is. And that's, that's essentially what, what minimalism is about, but it is also, uh, for much of these people, for much of the artists that were doing this, it is also a, a kind of an embracing of the idea of, um, the, the Taoist simplicity that is intrinsic to things like, uh, wabi-sabi and, um, very, uh, Asian ways of, of, of thinking, because this is when these concepts starts uh, really coming into the US as people are coming back from Korea, as people are engaging with, with business uh, relationships with Japan, it's, it's open for people to explore and human beings in the West really want something to help them deal with the stress that they have. And I think that, that is one reason why the minimalist artists were working with these ideas they were uh, very good at trying to stay away from exploration of of content and the meaning of content uh, and i really like this article in artland magazine where they say minimalism is what you see is what you see and i and i really i really like that if we look at things where like Dan Flavin is just exploring ideas, uh, not even ideas, he's just exploring the impacts and effects of different kinds of artificial lighting. Um, Saul Lewitt is really fascinated with just the simple structures that can be created with contemporary manufacturing processes. <clears throat> and Frank Stella, this to me feels very much like the op, um, the op art as well. And it's, it is, some of his pieces are very difficult to classify because it does feel like op art, but it also feels like uh, minimalism as well. Sometimes uh, pop art, excuse me. And what I think is ironic is these artists were trying to say that their art wasn't trying to say anything. But when I look at this, and I have a, an inkling of the environment that they were in, what I see are, again, meditations, you know, trying to find a, a, a stable anchor for calmness in a world that is just feels ridiculous. And I, I really love this like this. If the person there's there's no reason to include this kind of mint green bar of light there. Other than the fact that with that inclusion, this just feels finished. It somehow feels satisfying as an expression of light. Because if it was all solid yellow, I think it would be too much. I, I, I just think, so I, I think that they were actually doing more than what they, they told people that they were doing. Uh, and I, I think that that's really interesting. And I think it has more to do with just the enjoyment of creating the process. Now, Donald Judd, he's kind of a wackadoodle guy. He created uh, things that he thought were just fascinating as products of what the technology is available on the manufacturing floor. So he created sculptures like this with these brass shelves almost because he, he loved that you could create something like this with American uh, technical processes. And he would call these paintings. I, I have no idea why. I, I've read what he had to say about it, but it just, it, it kind of baffles me. But I, I think they're absolutely amazing. The different kinds of things that the, the that these folks are dealing with and addressing um, just as they explore the world around them and as they explore just the process of understanding art itself. Now, I have two more uh, uh, movements I wanna talk about today. And these are things that are still going on and should still continue, but they made a big splash at the time that they were introduced because it was so different than what people were expecting. Now we looked at Dada a little bit. And remember, do you guys 
uh, know why that movement was called Dada. Remember, we, we looked, there was a mannequin suspended from the ceiling. The, they made collages. They did really funny um, poetry where they alphabetized the words used. Do you guys remember why, or do you guys know why that uh, movement was called Dada? Wasn't it, it, it was during the time where, well, it originated in Germany, so I'm assuming it's German for something. Well, it, it was, um, yeah, it's, it's German, but it's like some of the first sounds that a baby will make. And it's interesting to me because those are the first sounds a baby will make regardless of where in the world it's born. And uh, the, the Dada's chose it specifically because it didn't appear to have a meaning. And this is the thing that's, that's really kind of interesting to me that they were trying to get people to examine who we give permission to, to allow us to think about meaning or allow us to come up with definitions. And for conceptual artists, that's what they were doing too. So I think with conceptual art, it ties really well into a continuation of Dada. However, the biggest difference is that the Dadaists were really frustrated with World War I and the aftermath and the, the lack of governance by the German and the Swiss. And with conceptualism, I, I think that, you know, 40 years later, they're dealing with ideas addressing uh, similar issues, but upset that the government doesn't want to take responsibility for the things that it does sometimes that don't make sense. So I, I think they're, they're similar situations. And uh, I want to, sh let's see if it, the, the sound will work on this one, because I think it's a really good uh, video that introduces to concept conceptual art. This is the kind of thing that conceptual art is, where this is considered a sculpture, and then neon spells out what it is, neon. So let's see if this will give a sound. Let me know if you guys hear the sound on this. Now we're moving into conceptual art, and this is... Can you guys hear that? Yes. Okay. Ryan, did you hear it? Now, this is about five minutes long. Um, we're going to watch it, and then we're going to talk about it. This is a vast change because this is art that is not being created to sell as such. We're not worried about the materials and the time and the technique necessarily. In fact, in some cases, the artist is not even creating their own piece. Sometimes they're conceptualizing it and having someone else create it. No, instead, conceptual art is about the conversation. So when you look at these pieces, it's not about how stunning this painting of the Annunciation is or how phenomenal this portrait is. Instead, it's about the conversation, which usually starts with one question. Is it art? And then from there, it takes a myriad of other directions. So let's try and define the undefinable. Let's try and define conceptual art. Now, conceptual art is a movement that prizes ideas over the formal or visual components of artwork. So they're focusing on that conversation, on the idea, not the composition. And we see an amalgam of various tendencies rather than a tight, cohesive movement. Conceptualism took a myriad of forms, such as performances, happenings, and ephemera. From the mid-1960s through the mid-1970s, conceptual artists produced works and writings that completely rejected standard ideas of art. Their chief claim that the articulation of an artistic idea suffices as the work of art. This also implied that concerns such as aesthetics, expression, skill, and marketability were all irrelevant standards by which art was usually judged. Now, this is going to be an issue, not for the artist, but for the gallery, because galleries need to sell art, and a lot of conceptual art isn't really something you can sell. You might be able to record it. Sometimes you can photograph it. 
but oftentimes it's not something you're really going to sell. It might be created for the space. It might be an installation. It might be a giant shark in a tank. You never know, but it's unlikely to sell. So it does rather change ideas of the art world. So drastically simplified, it might be seen to many people that what passes for conceptual art is not in fact art at all. Much like Jackson Pollock's drip paintings or Andy Warhol's Campbell's soup cans seem to contradict what previously had passed for art. But we're seeing a change of definition here. Even today, in the current world, the definition of art is very different than it was 100 or 150 years ago. Artists are moving in a different direction. They're focusing on different things. But it's important to understand conceptual art in a succession of avant-garde movements. We've been moving in this direction for a long time as we move from cubism to Dada to abstract expressionism to pop art, etc. We're constantly simplifying. We're constantly changing the definition of art very, very slowly up to the modern day. Don't forget this change from what we would term realism of the mid 19th century to today's conceptual art takes place over 150, almost 170 years now. I mean, that is a considerable amount of time. This is not happening nearly as quickly as people like to think. It's not a sudden idea. And they're self-consciously expanding the boundaries of art. Conceptualists themselves uh, are at the extreme end of this avant-garde tradition. In truth, it's irrelevant whether these extremely intellectual pieces of art match one's personal views of what art should be, because the fact remains the conceptual artists successfully redefine the, redefine the concept of a work of art to the extent that their efforts are widely accepted as art by the collectors, galleries, and museum curators. So really, if this tiny group of people, the art historians, the art critics, the collectors, etc., accept it as art, it's art. We kind of gave those people that responsibility. We gave the museum curators, the art historians, the gallery owners, the permission to say what is and isn't art. It's just implicit in the social contract. So when they accept it as art, it, it really is art. If you don't accept it as art, that's different. That's a personal opinion. But society as a whole, through its chosen representatives, has defined conceptual art as art. I think that that is really a fascinating uh, concept. That conceptual art is art because we have allowed decision makers to make that choice for us. And I think that that is a very valid, valid exploration because then we start ex expanding what art means. Uh, a, a, a way that se to help understand conceptual art that seems to be pretty consistently workable is with most things, uh, with, with most art uh, pieces, for example, uh, we can see that it's art because the artist, their intent is to create something specific, and then that specific creation is the art. What is different about conceptual art is that the artist may or may not make something specific. A lot of the times, they may have somebody else make the thing, or they may just use things that other people have already made. But they place it together with a context and a title to force you, if you're, if you're going to take the time to look at it, it forces you to think and participate in the meaning making of the thing. So that the, uh, that the object that they make is, or, or the object that they provide is not the finished art at all. The finished art is what that object does to your brain. So as other artists will use a palette knife and paints to paint to make their thing, or a chisel and stone to sculpt and make their thing, a conceptual artist will use things 
to change your mind. And the mind change that goes on is the thing that they're making. You know, if they're using painting or balls of string or whatever, those are the tools like the sculptor's chisel or the painter's paintbrush or palette knife. Uh, and the materials they're actually working in to create the finished art is your own imagination. That's why it's called conceptual art. And I, and I think it's fascinating. It, it, it really is interesting to me that artists become invested in this idea of engaging us as intelligent audience view audience you know and viewers uh, they they are purposely engaging us in helping them to create meaning and validity for the stuff that they're providing I, I think that that's that demonstrates to me an awful lot of trust and hope for example but I, I want to show you something just a couple examples of conceptual art for you to think about. This image right here is from uh, Joseph Kossuth, one in three chairs. And this image has, it's a, a photo of a display where he has a physical chair, then a life-size photograph of that physical chair. And over here, he has printed out a dictionary definition of this chair. So it's one chair that they're all representing a chair. And then the three is, these are three different views of what a chair potentially can be. So what do you think he is sculpting? What is he asking you or inviting you to think about? I think there's questions like, what is the real chair? What is the one chair is he talking about? Is he talking about the physical wood chair? Or is he talking about the, the, the single chair idea that ties all three of those things together? He didn't make the chair. He didn't make the definition. He didn't make the photograph process. All he did was put it together in a way with the title to invite us to start playing, playing around with our, our mind and engaging us in um, developing the meaning behind it by itself. Now, Sol DeWitt, I, I think he does some really fascinating stuff with just texture and design. And he invites people to participate and help him to build his sculptures and his paintings. John Baldessari does some really interesting stuff where he'll actually write down sentences out in cursive, or he'll give directions for somebody else to write it out for a certain amount of time or a certain number of iterations. And it becomes art because people are following his directions or he's creating an environment specifically to ask us to start thinking about the why and the purpose. Han Darbavan, I really like them because what they do is start creating these puzzle books. And sometimes they'll design the puzzle book themselves and then uh, fill it up with potential solutions, or they'll take puzzle books and just scribble on them with the wrong solutions. And if you have OCD, their stuff is really difficult to deal with because it's not all correctly solved. And I, and I, think, I think it's, it's very fascinating what, do you, what are some of the things do you think that Han Darbavin might be asking us to consider with those kinds of presentations? To think about how he got there, how he got to the answer. Yeah, what's he's uh, a big part of what they're doing is how do you arrive to an answer? And you know when when a lot of the answers are wrong, but they're done with such confidence with that black marker. What what other things might that make you think of? 
this time of year, always when I see their stuff, I always think about uh, the political arena. You know, I, there's a quote from uh, the TV show in NCIS where uh, one of the principal characters says to somebody, not only are you wrong, but you're wrong at the top of your voice. <laughs> this idea that being assertive about it doesn't mean that you're right. And I, I, I think that that's really interesting. So yeah, there's, but like you can come at it from how do they get to the answer? I can come at it from they're wrong with assertiveness. Neither of us are wrong. Both of us are right. And we're both right at the same time, even though we're saying we're seeing different things. And I think that that is, for me, that's really exciting because that's like a regular conversation with the artist, a real conversation. We have all these um, interesting ways at arriving to meaning and the resolution or what we assume, assume of the resolution of a conversation. And these works that we're looking at, the artists are somehow taking into account that process as well. And so as it, it feels to me that I am engaged in finishing the work and I have responsibility for finishing the work. And I love that. Now, then I want you to watch these videos about performance art that I, I, I think are really important. And this deals ties directly in with conceptual art. Performance art is where people take elements of performance that do not have a narrative, that, do, that don't necessarily fit with anything else, but are taking, taken out of context, not so that you see a finished product that is performance, but so that it invites you to help them to generate meaning as well, just like other conceptual art. And some of it is really interesting. <coughs> some of it is heartbreaking. Francis Alice, I really love the stuff that, that they do. One of my favorite pieces is that they've done is a performance art piece. They used uh, 500 people called Faith Moves Mountains. He did it in Mexico. They found a, a mountain that nobody cared about. And he had 500 people show up one day with shovels. And each of them started taking shovels and scooping dirt from one side of, the of this small mountain to the other side. By the end of the day, they had moved the mountain three feet, which sounds, okay, big deal. I'm talking about doing this in Mexico during a depressed economy. How do you think that that changed the worldview of the people that were involved in the project? They're recognized by geographers as having the power to actually move a mountain three feet on the map. And these were just ordinary people. What are some of the things that you think that, that meant to those people that participated? The first thing that comes to my mind is incredibly empowering. They did something that typically we allow a God to do and they participated working as a community. They did it themselves and they did it on purpose. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And so uh, he's an artist that I, I really enjoy seeing their stuff. Now, installation art is another aspect of conceptual art that I really love, where people build stuff on site. And one of the artists I really want you to look at are Christo and Jean-Claude. They will wrap plastic around objects, at, like coastlines and things like that. What do you do when you see a package that's wrapped up in bright colored paper? What do you do? What do you want to do? Just know what it is. Yeah, you want to open it up. And Jean-Claude and Christo are, were very good at doing that. They would wrap things with plastic specifically to force people to engage with what the object was and start asking those questions. And they would get invited to do things by the communities of the areas that they went to, to and ended up revitalizing everything about the communities that they were invited to because they, they created an environment to engage curiosity. And that really empowered people to actively engage with the creating them, helping them create the meaning behind the artwork. So look, look at those artists. 
and we i'm uh the last one i want to talk about is feminist art this i think is is absolutely amazing um and i'm so glad that it is recognized as its own um art movement i want to show you a couple examples you know we recognize these paintings and what i love about this victoria ellis she will take iconic paintings that everybody recognizes and the women that are being used as objects in the paintings are engaged with an activity that we recognize like what's mona lisa doing right here Pottery. What does it look like she's doing? Ceramics. Yeah. And the girl with the pearl earring is painting. And this Madonna is chiseling stone. And I love that because Victoria Ellis forces us to engage with the idea <clears throat> that women are empowered beings and are actors and not just subjects of being acted upon. And I love that. When we look at, uh, this is a good article. It talks about gender disparity in uh, museums. What is really, if, if you look at most art studio classes, uh, in, in, in a lot of them, you're gonna see maybe half and half men and women. Many of them, there's just gonna be slightly more women than men. You start looking at art history classes, a lot of them are going to have a little bit more women than men. And you would think that if that many people are in, interested, invested in learning about art and producing art, the amount of professionals that are make a living off of art should reflect those percentages. But even though it's women represent more than half of, the, of artists, over three quarters of artists that are in galleries, that are selling works, that are in museums are men, 87%. That is absolutely astounding to me. And there are, I want you to watch this video. I don't think we have time, but uh, feminist art is art that is created and it's, it's not just by women. It is uh, created by men and women, but it is art that is created specifically to engage in ideas of uh, traditional roles and gender expectations. Both, uh, sometimes to uh, expand the roles, sometimes to explore the roles, sometimes to uh, find out the history of the, those expected roles and sometimes to go directly against them. And I, I, there's a lot of really interesting and fascinating stuff. Now, one of the artists that I really like, and this is Barbara Kruger, she does a lot of these. She was actually the uh, photography editor for, um, I think it was Vogue magazine. And at one point she just got so tired that people were marketing towards women based on an assumption that women were not built right, were not ever good enough, and were never feeling confident. They had no reason to be confident because they needed women to feel complete with their product. And that, that's what you know, marketing towards women uh, um, has been based on for a long time trying to make women feel that they are incomplete without the, the product that's being marketed towards them. And that is true in some extent for many populations, but it's particularly true uh, for women. And so Barbara Kruger really addressed that heads on. And other feminist artists will do things where they just examine women in uh, at doing things that women do being women uh, with the same kind of 
assumed worthiness that male subjects have always have uh, seemed to hold. You know, it wasn't until relatively recently that most art schools would even allow uh, women models in their draw in their drawing and painting programs. Most of the time, if you wanted to draw or paint a, a woman as an artist, um, you would have to do that on your own. Uh, you know, men were even or the ones that were assumed to only be worthy of being the model uh, as you were going through the training, which, which I, I, it just seems absurd to me. Anyway, rant, you know, rant avoided. But look at this article, explore this and, and think about what is feminist art. One of my favorite feminist artists is Judy Chicago. I just love her stuff. So definitely watch this. Yayoi Kusama, I, I think is just amazing. She loves polka dots. And uh, she loves the things that make people just slightly uncomfortable. And Betty Saar is the woman that I want to be my grandma. She is one of the coolest ladies in the world. She does things that are confrontational and mind blowing simply because they need to be done and she doesn't take any crap about it. She just does it anyway. And I love her stuff. And Barbara Kroger uses those uh, media marketing tools that she's been familiar with to uh, engage women in an active environment where they're supported in exploring their own personhood and you know questioning the expectations of the world around them and definitely watch this interview with the gorilla girls these uh the gorilla girls is a group of women artists that they are actually very successful artists on their own art historians professors things like that but when they're part of the gorilla girls once they put the gorilla mask on they hide their identity and they're completely anonymous so they can say and get away do and get away with things that they would never be that they don't feel they could ever do and get away with in their ordinary uh, regular workaday life do you guys have any questions about so make sure that you go through this module and watch as many of those videos as you can and make sure that you look at those articles any questions about today was it okay that I went back and looked at abs, um, expression as abstract expressionism and abstraction again? Did that help then? Okay, good. All right, do you guys have any questions or observations? All right, great. I do want to say, as you um, didn't have a lot of people turn in their uh, proposals. I need you to email me your proposal before you get credit. And for credit, you need to turn in both your proposal to me and my response. And if necessary, our responses to each other after that. That's what you do to get uh, credit for this assignment. And please go to the syllabus and text me if I'm not responding to your email or anything like that. I've been having issues. I don't know exactly what it is. Actually, that's not true. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's probably user interface, which means, you know, it's my problem. But uh, you can text me and uh, we can talk on the phone about it or we can meet on campus and we can talk there uh, as you are considering what your final key, um, capstone project is. But uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Halloween, a wonderful week and a wonderful weekend. And I look forward to, to seeing everybody uh, next Thursday. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We'll see you later.